Well, thank you so much for um, hosting this and putting this on. This is such an amazing forum. I love doing it in person, and I'm especially excited to see the virtual option because, like you said, expanding this to even more patients, I think, is just a huge benefit. So I'm really excited to be a part of this. Um, like, like everyone said, I am a patient advocate. I've been living with Crohn's disease for about 12 years now. Um, really found myself wanting to become an advocate because of those early experiences that I had, and I like to talk about them um, with other um, clinicians and patients as well. So I do a lot of work um, supporting um, clinicians through teaching fellows, um, different research projects, and also patient communication work that might happen um, that different companies take on. So I have a lot of fun um, taking the time to share my story to help make sure that patients feel um, more involved and more supported and receive better care um, every day um, as they try to manage IBD. So thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Christina Jagalski. I am one of two GI uh, psychologists at Michigan Medicine. And uh, today, uh, Jessica and I will be talking about anxiety and depression in IBD. Um, so, let's see if it's going to let me advance my slide. Dr. Higgins, I seem to be having, oh, there we go. It was just delayed. Uh, so um, I'm going to start us off uh, today. Um, and first, just want to talk about the complexities of dealing with an IBD diagnosis. So as you can see, this is kind of a complex slide, and that's uh, on purpose. Uh, so uh, from the moment of diagnosis, um, patients are responsible for dealing with a number of factors, um, including um, really having to learn pretty quickly a lot of medical knowledge about their disease, um, about uh, medications, uh, about side effects, um, about the importance of preventative health care, um, and also about learning how to navigate the, the healthcare system, uh, how to, learning how to communicate with doctors, uh, which can be particularly challenging for um, anyone who's diagnosed uh, when, they're, when they're younger and may not have had experience with that yet. Um, learning how to interpret test results, a whole host of, of, of factors to consider. And uh, uh, studies have shown that on average, a patient uh, with IBD may spend around uh, three hours each year uh, in direct patient care with their uh, medical providers. And then the rest of that time is really uh, left to the patient's own self-management skills. So um, patients uh, have to be able to, you know, take their medications, uh, look for signs of disease flare, which can be uh, challenging at times to know whether or not um, uh, an issue is something that requires um, medical attention or whether that's maybe something that's temporary um, and a host of other factors. And for patients who have an ostomy, there's certainly a number of skills that are learned to, to manage that as well. Uh, and so uh, living with IBD um, really uh, requires uh, the development of self-efficacy, which is the ability to or the belief that you have the ability to organize and execute behaviors necessary to manage challenging situations. And then if you think about the impact of age of diagnosis on how someone might adjust to living with IBD, um, if you think about uh, um, patients who are uh, diagnosed earlier, uh, say in their adolescent or young adult years, um, this is already a time that is uh, uh, rich in development and developmental challenges. Um, uh, it's the period of identity formation, uh, making con uh, considerations for college and career, um, and then getting a diagnosis on top of that um, can really uh, impact all of these major developmental milestones. Um, you know, how does IBD fit into how I see myself? Uh, will I be able to take care of myself at college, can I can I feel comfortable going away to college as opposed to staying closer to home? 
Um, uh, and then certainly uh, thoughts about, you know, how does this impact uh, romantic relationships, family planning, and then financial independence, especially as people are thinking about um, uh, no longer being on their parents' health plan. And then for uh, people who are diagnosed um, uh, later in life, heading towards their retirement years, which is often um, a, a period that people have worked very hard for and may have had uh, uh, big plans for what it is that they hope to do once they uh, have moved into retirement, um, IBD can also uh, throw some additional challenges in there as well. Um, uh, so maybe having to think about, you know, how do I fit my treatments into travel plans? Um, uh, do I I know how to manage my symptoms um, if I if I want to travel or if I want to uh, move around. And so uh, the timing of diagnosis can also impact how one adjusts to IBD. And we also know, and I hear this quite a bit from many of my patients, that one of the biggest struggles of living with IBD is living with an invisible illness. So uh, especially if on the outside, uh, maybe nobody can tell uh, that you are um, might be feeling ill or, or that you're dealing with any type of chronic illness. Um, uh, it can be a real struggle because behind the scenes and below the surface, uh, you we all know uh, what uh, the uh, types of issues are that you might be having to deal with at the same time that you're just trying to live your life and, and do and meet the challenges of, of life that you're, you're trying to do. So dealing with experimental medications, perhaps hospital stays, the impact of steroids, uh, dealing with pain, fatigue, uh, dietary restrictions, uh, dealing with financial factors, uh, possibly having to miss events, uh, the impact on career, relationship, uh, family planning, as we talked about, uh, uh, adjusting to an ostomy if you have one, um, and impact on body image. So there's a lot of things that a patient may be uh, dealing with, and that certainly can impact mental health. So uh, that kind of brings us to the purpose of this talk. So um, we do know that patients with IBD are uh, have uh, two to uh, sometimes three times higher rates of anxiety and depression compared to the general population. Uh, the, uh, and the research shows that uh, patients with more active disease tend to have higher rates of, of depression and anxiety. Um, and so um, in addition to the impact of anxiety and depression on uh, quality of life and, and um, uh, being able to pursue goals and, and navigate various life challenges, we also know that anxiety and depression can specifically impact patients' medical outcomes. Um, so uh, anxiety uh, is associated with um, increased risk of surgeries, uh, decreased adherence to medication regimens, uh, increased perceived stress, um, and poor quality of life. And uh, depression uh, uh, puts people at increased risk of inflammation. Um, this is um, possibly related to the fact that depression is also now considered to be an inflammatory condition, and so this can compound IBD. Um, and it uh, also puts people at increased risk of pain, poor response to IBD treatment, and increased risk of IBD flare. So uh, it's really important that um, if uh, you or someone you know are dealing with depression and anxiety, um, that uh, we uh, address this uh, in order to help you be able to both have improved uh, a quality of life and to be able to um, get the best possible IBD treatment. I'm going to turn it over to Jessica now. Thank you. So um, I know that like all topics in chronic illness, um, how each one of us experiences depression and anxiety may affect each of our lives um, just a little bit differently. Uh, I've definitely experienced it myself, but I wanted to honor the fact that we may all have a little bit of a different journey. So I started off preparing for this talk by throwing out this, um, the concept of, of describing what it felt like to receive a new diagnosis to all of my um, IBD family on social media. And this word cloud is a weighted representation of what people shared with me. So they felt overwhelmed, scared, um, frustrated, sometimes in denial, 
um, that hard decisions were, that they had to take on hard decisions, missing school. And I'm sure for everyone on this call with the IPD, that none of that is new information. Um, but if you feel that way, and you haven't heard from others that they felt that way too, just know that you're not alone in this. And so I think, and, and um, when preparing for this talk, I spend a lot of time thinking through my own journey. I think that the, the ways that we might experience anxiety and depression might look a little bit different at the beginning of our IVD journey than um, once we get established. And so I kind of threw that out there if you wanna switch to the next slide for me. And I found that um, my peers also shared uh, a one word answer of how they would describe IBD today a little bit differently, that, that they felt a little more settled, that things were a little more manageable, that they were learning or prepared and felt resilient. And I think that that's the goal um, for many of us when we're trying to manage this illness. And I think anxiety and depression are, are very prevalent and maybe even the determining factors in how well we feel um, we can manage the disease because it's a chronic illness and it's lifelong, so it doesn't go away. But what's amazing is that how we manage it and how we're able to get in front of it and support ourselves as we move through it um, changes how we feel about it. And um, if you wanna switch to the next slide, a lot of what I wanted to talk about today was, um, okay, so what do we do about that? So we all know that this this can happen, um, that, that when you're dealing with something that is physically, mentally, socially, um, impactful in such a way that is out of your control and is forever, what are ways that we can help manage that? So today I'm just going to share some of the tips and tricks that would be outside of what you would get um, if you went to a, a specialist or a clinician or a therapist. But these are the like lifelong at home management tips. Um, First and foremost, I think for many of us, we have to recognize that our experience, each of our experiences is unique and that we're not alone as we go through this. And um, this is where I'd love to share just a little bit of my story. When I was first diagnosed, it took five years before I met someone else with IBD. That's a long time to navigate the world. Um, experiencing what you're going through and what we all know to be the symptoms of, of disease that for me at the time were not managed well and to feel like I'm super alone in that. So it's hard, it's hard, that's really hard at the beginning. So the next thing I say to anyone and everyone, no matter where they are in their disease course is find your IBD tribe. If you haven't yet, reach out and connect with people. And in today's world, we have this beautiful virtual opportunity to connect with people, to follow them on Twitter and just hear them talk about what it's like and be able to say, yeah, me too, like I feel that. Or to be able to reach out and text a friend. Um, I know when I was really struggling taking a certain medication that hurt a lot when I injected it, I, I had an amazing friend that I could text and say, I don't wanna do it. <laughs> and he would say, you can do this, you can do this. And that, really helped with a lot of those feelings of, of being alone and um, feeling uncertain and unsure that can lead to um, stronger issues with anxiety and depression down the road. So I just always like to, to preface um, any time I talk about this with the fact that we're all trying to navigate that world. Um, then I tell people to talk, write, and share. Whatever feels natural for you, you've got to get it out. You've got to honor and recognize that you are dealing with um, something that's really challenging and you've got to be able to, to sort through that on, on your own time to be able to put words to it, to be able to then um, talk and share with others what you're going through. Um, and it can be a very cathartic experience. So I kind of, on my blog that I started a few years ago, that was an amazing experience for me to just talk about and write about what I was going through. And then other people could say, wow, this was really helpful and that felt great. Or people could say, um, you know, I'm going through that as well. And we were able to connect and share and, and kind of realize, okay, I'm not alone as I go through this. It does, it does feel like crap when I don't feel well. That also doesn't feel well mentally and I'm not alone in that. Um, and then I also just like to talk to people about, so what do you do once you've found your tribe and you've started to really explore your experience through whatever makes sense to you, whether it's talking, writing, singing, sharing with others, finding, finding groups. Um, so how do you, what do you do with that information? 
And one thing that I think is just the best thing is to harness the power of pivoting or framing success in ways that make sense for you. So um, for me, you know, when I when we look at that list at the beginning of this talk of all the things that might be impacting and contributing to anxiety and depression for individuals with IBD, right? We saw like all those life goals, pregnancy, parenthood, jobs, school, the social life, and I even even on the 65 and up, travel, <laughs> um, even worrying about retirement. Um, honestly, all of those things profoundly impacted me, but what I was able to do was to constantly break them down and reframe what that might look like. So I love to give the example of, of exercise. Um, I went through a journey for about six years of trying to figure out how I could be physically active in a way that um, felt like an accomplishment to me. And at first I wanted to run a half marathon. And then um, I, d I struggled with joint issues and I started to realize that, that that wasn't going to be a reality, but rather than just quit, I pivoted and I said, okay, so shorter distances are something that I can do. So let's work on um, 5Ks and let's pick 5Ks that are at the same time benefits to um, IBD or, or, or research through um, different organizations like the CCFA. Um, and then I could feel really good doing it, connect with other people, but reframe what the fitness meant for me. And then when I started to um, go into a flare again, I had to, instead of just drop and say, well, I'm not gonna exercise, I had to pivot and say I was gonna do yoga. And that was still physical exercise and I was going to keep to that good habit and routine and feel accomplished every time I did it. And some days there was five minutes that was all I could do of yoga, but um, I was able to feel feel good about it. And honestly, it's it's trying to figure out how to still make those things happen for yourself, but being really honest about how to um, reframe, reshape, um, pivot to a different definition of what success means on a regular basis. I think many of us with something as challenging as and unpredictable at times as IBD, we need to do that so that we can continue to reach goals or feel good or feel accomplished or feel a sense of control over something. Um, and then we need to celebrate it. You know, I think that, um, especially, I don't know about everyone else on the call dealing with IBD, but we're seeing success as these beautiful Instagram worthy model pictures. And um, maybe success is, is like, I did that five minutes of yoga and, and celebrate it and share and talk to people. And, and, and when they say, I've got some CrossFit friends all right, so I, I definitely hear them and I see their muscles. And when they say, I did this awesome, whatever burpee thing, I can say, yeah, well, I'm really excited because I was able to get a 15 minute walk and 15 minutes of yoga in today. And that was, that was really hard for me to get in. And I'm really proud of that work. So, you know, just know that you're not alone. Find that tribe if you don't have one. Be open to, to really exploring what your experience is so that you can put words to it. Um, Find different ways to define success for yourself if you're struggling in that area and just feeling like, gosh, I can't get what I want done, which I, I know that feeling and it hurts and it's hard. And then just celebrate the crap out of yourself um, because it's really, really important. Um, next slide. So in the next slide, um, we're gonna see that I think once you are able to um, really harness the power of your personal experience, figure out how to um, frame and shape your days to find that success, like just re in relentless pursuit of, of reaching whatever that goal could really mean for you. Um, I find that it's really helpful to then turn that work outwards and figure out how to be an advocate for what is an incredibly important topic when it comes to IBD. So support others in the IBD community as, as much as you can safely while also recognizing what your needs are. Um, if nothing else, just normalize the experience. You know what? It is a little bit depressing when you are in bed for three days and the world moves on before you can even kind of get out again. You know, I spent my last birthday in the bathroom and that was a hard day for me. So I talked about it and I said, that, that, that's, it's scary not knowing if that's gonna happen. It's sad when it does, 
Um, so talk about it and share and support each other and say, that's real, that that sunk, and we can get move through it. And here's what we can do to make that happen, um, to move through it and move past it. And um, if you're struggling, if, if you're finding like you're at home, your connections, your hard work, you're pivoting, you're writing, you're exploring, if that's not getting you to where you need to be, you need to advocate for yourself with your clinician. Um, really feel confident speaking up, sharing your experience, um, talking about what that means to you, how that impacts you, how that is rel related to and a part of your IBD diagnosis. Um, I think that, you know, that study that we saw a few slides earlier was done, uh, it looked like published in 2017. I guarantee that in 1997 and even probably 30 years before that, patients were saying, um, when I feel really bad, my disease gets worse. So it's nice that the medical community is catching up with us, but that only happened because patients said, this is happening to us and to our bodies and we know it and we recognize it. So just feel confident um, when you get to a good place inward to, to turn that outward, support the community, ex normalize that experience and advocate for yourselves and advocate for yourselves with your clinician. Um, so then I'll turn it over and we can talk more about what that looks like when you need to have a little more support. Thank you, Jessica. I really appreciate you sharing uh, your story and those really helpful uh, tips. Uh, so when is it time to start thinking about seeking uh, perhaps, perhaps professional mental health support? Um, so certainly anxiety and depression um, are something that um, most people at some point in their life will experience um, from time to time. Um, and so, and that is certainly normal and it does not mean that necessarily that you need to pursue mental health support um, if, if those symptoms are, um, are, are lasting for shorter periods of time and not significantly impacting um, your life. Um, but the, the main three factors that we think about when we're really recommending mental health support would be, first of all, uh, how long have these symptoms been going on? Um, you know, if they're lasting for weeks on end um, and seem to be lasting, you know, most of the day, most of the week, um, to where this is kind of becoming more of a chronic state, um, then we want to, um, we definitely want to think about um, introducing some mental health support. Um, are the symptoms interfering with daily life, with your ability to go to work, to go to school, to, um, to engage in your social life, uh, uh, to be able to get pleasure out of life and enjoy hobbies, uh, to help with motivation, um, mental health support would definitely be indicated if you're finding that you're having difficulty in those areas. And then is um, anxiety, depression, or any other mental health condition for that matter, impacting your ability to uh, uh, adhere or take uh, to follow uh, uh, your medical uh, treatment rec uh, recommendations? Um, is it making it harder for you to get to your appointments? Are you feeling more likely to cancel your appointments um, because of anxiety or depression? Um, but that's another reason um, that we would definitely recommend uh, reaching out for support. Um, and the good news is, is there's, there's definitely hope. Um, it does not, you do not have to, to always feel this way. There are really good evidence-based treatments that can be really Really helpful to help really improve quality of life. And so how do we do that? Um, so these are just a couple of resources um, that, that uh, uh, might be helpful in looking for a mental health provider. So for, um, for anyone who is interested in working with a GI specific provider who has GI expertise, um, you'll see the top link there with the Rome Foundation. Um, they have put together a, uh, a GI psychology directory, and this is now um, international. Um, and so while we used to say that there was very few of us, uh, this directory I think has now expanded to over 100 uh, providers across the country, though so, uh, you know, some states have more resources um, than others. Um, and then uh, if, you, uh, if say you are not able to find a GI specific provider in your area, or perhaps you are um, more in need of, of a more of a general mental health provider to deal with other uh, concerns, the website Psychology Today uh, can be a, a very helpful resource. This is often the one that uh, psychologists will use as well to look for uh, providers. Um, and so on that website, uh, you can narrow down the search by topic area so you can look at anxiety. You can also look for someone who has experience working with chronic chronic illness. Um, you can also narrow it down by uh, 
region, uh, insurance coverage, and a host of other factors. So that's a really good resource to get you started. Um, and then uh, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation has a whole section that is very well developed on mental health with fact sheets and videos. I highly encourage um, looking at that. Um, I did develop, I, I developed a handout that I'm still trying to figure out how I can get that uploaded. So um, if we're not able to get that uploaded today, I will find a way, uh, maybe see if Dr. Higgins can send that out as well. Um, that includes all of these links as well as some additional links that might be helpful. Um, and then uh, just lastly here, um, the link in the middle uh, addresses uh, uh, the GI Behavioral Health Program. So if you are interested in, in uh, learning about our program, um, there's additional uh, information there as well. Okay. That brings me to the end of our talk. Any okay. So um, if you can turn off screen sharing and turn on your webcam, we're going to start taking questions on this topic. Um, I'm hoping folks have a lot of questions. Um, this is a really popular area. I did see one question earlier, um, and I can't recall who it was from, who was asking, oh, here we go. Um, along with these great tips, what type of provider should we reach out to if one needs extra help with anxiety or depression, especially as we develop non-medical tools as, such as exercise and meditation? And then I don't want to be ashamed to ask for Valium or something else that will help. Certainly. So, um, I, so the uh, in terms of uh, looking for a uh, uh, provider. So the, um, the website that I provided uh, can be helpful for helping you navigate um, different types of treatment. Um, and uh, certainly um, there are a number of health psychologists as well that are often uh, involved in helping with exercise, meditation, you know, maybe non-specific to uh, 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 different types of treatment other than some of the classic mental health treatments that we use in our practice. So they may be a good resource for uh, uh, finding support um, or if you're looking for someone, because uh, I'm not 100% certain on what the, the, the uh, question was pertaining to, if you're looking for help with accountability or goal setting, that a health psychologist is a good resource for that as well. And then in terms of you know not feeling um, uh, ashamed to uh, reach out for medication. Certainly, um, there's there's no reason uh, to be ashamed about that. And you can have um, that discussion with your uh, primary care physician. Um, but you can also, uh, if you would like uh, someone with uh, um, additional uh, mental health expertise, then getting a consultation with a psychiatrist will be very helpful to discuss medication management. And Jess, I, I know it's very common, about 40% of IBD patients at some point will have clinically significant anxiety or depression, but, you know, when do you decide that things like exercise and meditation aren't quite doing it? What are sort of the signs that are sort of your warning signs? I think that's a great question, and it's actually similar warning signs to when I have really active disease, too, in the sense that I stop being able to reach those really important life goals. So that's going to look different for everyone, but I think everyone in the back of their head has this thing that they know they need to do. For me, it's parenting my kids. And I will never forget the day that I was lying on the couch and my one-year-old was in the little pack and play thing. And I looked at him and I was like, I, I can't pick you up today. And I was just so tired and sick, but also just like really bumming out about it because as a mom, I was just feeling like, wow, this is I was not meeting my child's needs. And that minute I called the um, nurse on call with my GI office. So, um, you know, I think that that was probably, that was the first time I'd really ever experienced that was years ago. I think the the sooner you can get in front of it, the better. So start talk about, talking about it. For me, it wasn't as normalized. I wasn't talking about it. Um, these days I would never probably go that far. I would probably talk a lot earlier. So that's why I always like to tell people, um, you know, start exploring your experience early so that you can be your own best advocate and expert. And then as far as just to touch on that question of who to go to, I also think it's okay to think about who's your safe space to. So for me, my GI and I have been together for 10 years. 
um, it was really normal and okay for me to talk to him directly to, to just help him, to ask him to help me navigate that a little bit, um, because that was a really safe space. And it also impacted how we talked about the medical management of my disease as well. So even if your GI isn't the first person to go to, I would bring it up to them because um, you may want to advocate for and talk about how you, your medical management might not be meeting your needs too if you are dealing with, with both active disease and some anxiety and depression around it. Great. I find a lot of folks, what really gets them emotionally is when they can't fulfill the role they have in their family, um, whether it's being a mom or dad or just doing what they feel like they've committed to do, that's really tips people over in a big way. It's, it's really hard. Um, I have another question from Hannah Goodman. Um, have there been studies on the connection between meds like SSRIs to treat anxiety, depression, and IBD symptoms? Uh, since I started taking one of these drugs about a year ago, my symptoms have been much better and are affecting my day-to-day -day less. So, Dr. Jagiesley, any evidence specifically in IBD patients for the effect of SSRIs and the downstream effects on being able to handle IBD? So, I, I um, can't speak to specific studies on that. I might defer to you and to, if you to know whether or not you've got specific information. Um, uh, but we certainly know that that uh, by addressing anxiety and depression, um, that um, that that in general, and I'm, I'm speaking more so to, we know that improving mood, addressing anxiety, can improve. Um, uh, self-care uh, can help improve uh, patient uh, adherence to medications. It can help with uh, dietary uh, and, and uh, getting a healthy diet, ability to pursue things like exercise, which also can help with uh, IBD well-being as well. Yeah. And I don't know if this helps at all, but um, for me, when I, as this would be a in very individualized response, but for me, when I recognized that I was challenged with both IBS and IBD um, after, and this probably ties into many of the talks going on today, but after the trauma of experiencing IBD and then the anxiety in public places, especially for me, the biggest trigger was flying in the airport. And when I was able to pull that out and realize that and then use, um, like in that case, uh, just a, a PRN medication just to help me, support me in that um, public place, then my GI symptoms really changed in that scenario. Um, so pulling out and recognizing that I was challenged with both IBS and IBD um, was able to change what I used to say were all IBD symptoms. So in that case, um, having that med to help with the anxiety really changed with um, the physical symptoms. That's great. Um... Um, a question from Eric Doughty. Any additional advice for finding an IBD tribe and breaking the ice, especially locally? How do you reach out and find your people? Yeah, so especially as adults, we are all challenged with this. How do you make friends? And then how do you make friends in the chronic illness community? And I'll say that I, I've not met a person with IBD who didn't love having someone say to them, oh my gosh, you have IBD too. Let's let's talk about it. Like, honestly, it it is literally as simple as we see each other at conferences and the minute you say, hi, I'm so-and-so, I have Crohn's or I have ulcerative colitis or I have um, IBD, it, it's an immediate connection. So the first thing is to just tell yourself that people with IBD want to be friends with other people with IBD if they're public and out and talking about it. Now, that may not be the case if someone's not wanting to be public about it, but if you're going to a conference and you're walking around with a badge that says, I'm Jess and I have IBD, or you're on Twitter and your name is chronically Jess, chances are pretty good you're wanting to, con you're there because you want to connect. So put yourself out there. Know that other people with IBD want you to be in their tribe. We all support each other. I don't know a single person with IBD who, who is out in public about it and who doesn't then want to be sharing. There are, you know, there are in-person support groups Try them out. If they don't work for you, that's okay. But try them out. If in-person isn't working for you right now, there are online support groups. So the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation does host online support groups. And there are chat groups online and there are Facebook groups. Um, Facebook groups specifically to moms. IBD Moms is out there. Facebook groups specifically to girls. Um, girls with Guts is out there. I'm sure, I just don't have the resource for a man specific, but I'm sure that there is. There are awesome specific groups. 
join them, join them and just go in and tell yourself, these people are here because they want to be friends with me. So I'm, I'm going to just put myself out there and, and give it a try. Great. Um, we have a few more questions, but we're going to have to move on. This is a very popular topic. 